it is a great spirit in the in this church. It really is. You you walk in the door and you could sense, uh, you know, you could sense a, a a welcoming atmosphere in here. I believe you can. I do. I believe that people that come in here feel a welcoming spirit, a welcoming atmosphere. I remember Joyce and I had visited a church one night back when we lived in New Jersey. We were invited. I think they were having. Um, if I remember, maybe some revival services or something. And, uh, and apparently the guest speaker of the week had a conversation with the pastor. <laughs> and, it, and I guess it didn't go that well because he spent about an hour and a half blasting that church. <laughs> apparently there was a, a spirit of disunity in the church towards each other, towards the pastor, and, and we're just guests there, and, and it was so uncomfortable <laughs> sitting there while he's blasting <laughs> the congregation for their behavior, and I'm like, man, we didn't need to be here for this. This seemed like a private moment <laughs> because, you know, there he's trying to fix a problem in here, and I don't know that he accomplished anything, but I know one thing, we never went back. <laughs> it was not a good feeling being in a church getting blasted because of their disunity. <laughs> yeah. I remember before Joyce and I were saved, we were looking for a church to get married in. And, you know, so we visited several different churches. And, you know, the one that I liked was the one where it seemed everyone left you alone and everyone left each other alone. It's like, I can get in, I can get out. We weren't saved. And, and like, yeah, that's perfect, you know, but not a very, but if you're looking for the Lord, you wouldn't go there because everybody left you alone and everybody left each other alone. That's not a good representation of, of a welcoming church. That's if you want to get in and you want to get out and say, check that off your list. We went to another church where I, all I remember, I don't remember the message or anything, but I just remember being greeted in the parking lot afterwards by somebody from the church. He said, listen, don't listen to that guy that was preaching. <laughs> He's not our regular pastor. We're, I think he said we're in between pastors or something, but, but he was putting him down. You know, I guess in an effort to reach us, he's putting the speaker down and Needless to say, we didn't go back to that church because we sensed the disunity there amongst the people, not even knowing any better, not being Christians ourselves. So not only, you know, not only did we not go back there, it left, not only did that particular church leave a bad impression on us, it left a bad impression of the church on us. You know, we're not Christians, and, and we just like, well, man, if this is what church is, we didn't want any part of, of church in general. You know, because disunity is unappealing, isn't it? It's ugly. It's unattractive. When you walk into a place and you, and you sense that there's a disunity there, and it turns you off. It's like, I just, you just want to be, get out of there. It, there's not, it doesn't give you a welcoming feeling. You know, so I looked up disunity in the dictionary, the Webster's 1828 dictionary, simply means a state of separation. You know, state of separation. And I found some other words I didn't know. You know disunite. <laughs> well, that's the verb form of disunity. It's, it just means to separate or to join. Disuniter is a word. <laughs> You're a dis, you could be a disuniter. That's someone who, who, who separates, who he or she disjoins. You know where there's disunity? There's usually a disjoint, disuniter behind it. <laughs> Don't be a disuniter. <laughs> don't, be, don't be that person that meets some, meets some... Listen, if somebody meets you in a parking lot and tells you, don't listen to me, <laughs> they're, they're a, a disuniter. <laughs> you know, when I ask for... When it's, every, occasionally, I, I can't be here, so I ask the pastor to come and fill in for me, and, and I'm always confident. I just know that, you know what, whoever comes here and, and stands here and fills this pulpit is going to be blessed they're going to have a great experience because they're going to come and you guys are welcoming, you guys are united. I know what the, all the different praise teams that come down here, they love to come down here from Georgetown because there's, it's a welcoming, united spirit in this place. They, so they love to come here and, and, and lead us here in worship. You know, if, um, it's just, like you said, it's fun to be around people who are united for a cause, isn't it? It's fun to be around. It's pleasant to be around, you know, people who are united. If there was division here, 
well, nobody would want to come here. Nobody, no, none of the praise teams would want to come here. If they would have come here and, it was a, and they saw disunity and, and strife and contention among us, it would be a burden for them to come here because it's not pleasant. Nobody wants to be around disunity. How much more does unity mean to the unsaved person or the guest who wanders in here? I'm sure Susan wouldn't invite her friends here if there was a, or she, you know, if there was a spirit of disunity here. How much more so for the, the somebody who sees the sign that says, you know, the issue is always the heart, and they come in and see a heart of disunity. Well, that's the, the, you guys have an issue there, and, and you have the wrong heart, and and it would be unattractive and unappealing to them. And they may never, you know, they'll, they, the church will be ugly to them. They may never go into another church. You know, it's the reason why many people don't go to church is because of the disunity amongst churches. One of the, of all the spiritual problems that we face today, you know, which one do you think gets the most ink in the Bible? What sin, what's the sin that based on scriptural frequency is mentioned the most, dealt with most in the Bible. Is it, is it murder? It's not murder. Is it adultery? It's, it's contention and strife. Contention and strife is dealt with most frequently in the, in the New Testament. You know, it seems, it seems like it concerns God more than any other. It's the number one sin in the New Testament, contentiousness and strife at least mentioned. It's a, it's, just hap- it's a major theme. It's a major theme throughout the New Testament. Even here in, in Philippians, the first church was the best church. You know, the first church was the best church. It was the most pure church. You know, the church in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, they were, known, they were a pure church. They were known for their unity. So it's no wonder that the enemy would attack unity. If it was unity that that was the trademark of the, the best church. So ever since the first church, Satan has come against the unity of the church to divide us, to divide the church, to divide Christians, because that is, you know, to divide is to, is to conquer. And he's done a good job of it. So much of what's written in the New Testament is to get the church back to what it was in the beginning. You know, that's all we're trying to do. That's all the writer Paul's trying to do. That's all you know. The James is trying to do, and, and Peter's trying to do. What they they experienced what the power of the early church, and they saw how disunity got into the church, and false teachers who came in and divided. And listen, this is what we need to do to get back to where we can be, to get back to that first love, that first that purity of the church. And so much of what they have to deal with is contention and strife among believers. So last week, we saw how Paul introduced the subject. You know, we said unity is something worth striving for, right? Unity is worth fighting for. And most of the problems he dealt with last week were from, from um, pressures from outside of the church, per- people persecuting the church and pressures from outside that were threatening unity. Now, this week, he's going to deal with pressures from inside the church, within the church, because there's no greater threat to unity than, than the people inside, than the threat inside the church. So he turns his, his attention to, he, to, to you and to me here in verses 1 through 4, chapter 2. He says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. It's a lot in that scripture. I'm going to read it to you again, but from the message translation. Sometimes the message just gives us a, a really neat picture of, of what Paul is trying to say. Sometimes Paul could be kind of hard to understand. Here it is in the message. Listen, he's saying, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Do me a favor. 
if, if you love me, do me a favor. If you love Christ, do me a favor. If you really love me, do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> to help us understand it a little bit more, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, my kids and probably my greatest, Joyce and I, pro- both of us would say this, our greatest regret as parents having two children is not foster, not being intentional enough in fostering a relationship between them two, fostering a closer relationship between my daughter and my, and my son. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not at odds with each other, but, but there's, they're not as close as I see some siblings. You know, they don't have that, that closeness. And um, I just wish they were closer because it would bring Joyce and I great joy to see them closer, to see them, you know, really connected with each other. You know, I might say like, Paul, listen, if you have gotten anything at all from us as your parents, if we've made any difference in your life, do us a favor and love each other. Be deep-spirited friends with each other because, you know, do me a, do us a favor. That's what we want to see. We want to see you guys close. We want to see you as deep-spirited friends. It would bless us if, if you, if anything, we, if what Jesus has done for you, if what I have, we have done for you, do us a favor and just love each other. You know, that, does that, that, that helps me picture what Paul's trying to say. Listen, I'm in prison, he's saying, it brings me great joy when I see you standing firm, you know, loving one another, fighting for the faith of the gospel. You know, Erica was our first child, and of course we spoiled her with attention. We really did. I mean, I, I, I'm watching my daughter do it now with, with her daughter, just nonstop attention. And, and she, uh, you know, she was not a bet. So Michael, my son, came along three years later, and, and guess what? Well, Erica wasn't about to share that attention with him. She was not happy to share that attention. And really, she never got over it as she, you know, she's over it now, obviously. But, you know, and it was so sad when I would see little Michael try to connect with her and play with her or whatever, get involved in her, and she'd just push him away. <laughs> Just push them away. It's like, you know, and it would break our hearts, but, you know, there's only so much we could do. We could have done a better job at fostering relationship, but, but it's heartbreaking, you know, to see that. And of course, she's not like that any, anymore. But the point that is that it brings us joy as parents to see our children dwelling together in unity, and it brings us sorrow when we don't. And it's the same with Paul with his spiritual children, because that's, it's the same with Jesus and, and his children. It brings Jesus joy when we are united and it brings him sorrow when we're divided. It brings him sorrow. It, the unity is worth fighting for. It bring, when, you, when you set your mind against somebody else, when you set your heart against somebody, it brings sorrow to God, just as it does when we see our children divided against each other. It's not worth it. It's not, if you love Jesus, don't be divided against your brother or your sister, is what he's saying. You know, Paul said the greatest threat to unity is selfish ambition. We say selfishness, right? Same thing. And the cause of selfishness is conceit or pride. Pride would be another word for conceit. So basically, it's the thought that I'm more important than you. Selfishness, conceit, is mean, you know, just I'm more important than you. My life matters more than your life. You know, we all tend to feel that way. It's like, this is my life. My life matters more than your, it matters to me more than your life matters to me. You know, that's the, that's the idea behind it. My, my needs, my life matters more than yours. My needs come before yours. How do you know if you have this in you? We all do. Ever, if you lived in Sussex County long enough, you've been stuck behind a, a farm tractor. <laughs> that is frustrating. You're trying to get somewhere, and here's this farmer riding 
five miles an hour, and you can't sometimes, especially now, you can't pass them because all the cars coming. And what's your attitude when you get behind that? What goes through your mind when you get behind that farm truck? You know, I've heard people say that there should be a, a law against that. They should not be allowed to ride on the roads. <laughs> I've heard that. They should, hey, maybe, I'm not going to ask, maybe you've said that. There should be a law. They should not be able to hold up traffic like this. And, and you know, they're usually in a fancy car with non-Delaware plates. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Say, oh my, or oh me. The unselfish person sees the importance of that farmer. The unselfish person has patience and says, you know what, that farmer's doing an important job. That, there's, you know, we need that farmer to get to his field so we could eat. You know, there's an importance. And, and I'm just going, you know, what are we going to do if we don't have the farmers? They're, the farmers are important. and They're more important than me right now. Their job, what they're trying to, what they're trying to get to is more important than where I'm trying to get to. You know, that's the unselfish mind. You know, not just that they're a hindrance and they shouldn't be there. Um, by s- and this is the key. He says, let each esteem others better than himself. You know, how does this happen? How does this happen? You know, how's the, but how, does the, how is the farmer better than me? Well, he's better than you in that moment, isn't he? Or for that purpose, you know, by simply realizing, listen, every single person around you, every single person you meet, Look around you. Every single person in this room is better than you in some way or something. In some way or something. They have a quality, a trait. Something about them is better than that quality or trait in you. And something about you is better than that quality or a quality or trait in them. You know, that's what makes us complete when we're together, isn't it? Because we, you know, instead of, you know, I'm better than you. No, there's something. We're looking for the best in a person, that, that trait that, that helps make up for that trait in your, that is lacking in you. You know, our carnal, you know, with, you can have an Ivy League education, be the smartest person in any room, but drive by a farm and can't distinguish between a soybean and a tomato plant. I can't. If it's not a corn stalk, I have no idea what's growing in there. I have no idea. Am I alone? No idea. It's just growing. I, th- I didn't know what the farmer planted over here. Turns out he didn't plant anything. It was just weeds. <laughs> I'd have been eating weeds because I had no idea he didn't plant. It looked, looked good to me. It was weeds. So I didn't know it was weeds, so I got a call from the, the township. You got to cut them weeds down. <laughs> we don't know. The farmers are important. What would we do without them? We would starve. I don't care how smart you are. <laughs> you're not going to... We need to eat. See, our carnal nature is to find fault with the people around us, to feel better about ourselves. I mean, ever remember grade school? <laughs> At least where I grew up, we tore each other up every day and each other's mothers. It was brutal. <laughs> we... <laughs> We tore each other up because that's our carnal nature. That's what we do. You know, you know we, we try to we tear people down to feel better about ourselves. You know, we obviously grow out of that, thankfully, most of us. But, but it's still part of our nature to, to see the worst in people so we can feel better about ourselves. And Paul's saying, no, do, do just the opposite. Look for the best in people around you because everyone has something about them that when joined together makes us stronger. And verse 4 is the key. Others. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Others is the key to the passage. It's the Christian faith that made the word others important. Do you know that? The Christian faith. When Christianity came along, others became a thing. Because in, in history, people, didn't look, people looked out for themselves. Christianity made others important. The world isn't other-centered, is it? It's self-centered. You know, even the good that we do in the world, there's good people do good things in the world, but it's primarily to make themselves feel better about themselves. You know, if I do good, I'll feel better about me. It's not for the good of the others as much as it is for the good that it makes me feel. Why did Christ come from heaven's glory to this earth? 
It was for others. What did he get out of it? You know, it was others. It was for others. Why should our conduct be worthy of the gospel? Why should we fight for unity? Why should we be willing to suffer? Why should we carry the gospel out to the world? It's for others. To think of others rather than ourselves is is to have the mind of Christ. Christ thought of others and he left his glory in heaven and came to earth. Now Paul's going to tell us about the mind of Christ. In verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know the mind of Christ? He's Because you need to have the mind of Christ. Paul's saying, let his mind be your mind. Let his attitude be your attitude. Let his perspective be on life be your perspective on life. Have the same mindset, the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ. What is the one thing that characterized the mind of Jesus? Humility. When we think of Jesus, we know that he humbled himself. We think of humility. He lived a life of humility. And there's no scripture, I believe, in the Bible that presents the humility of Jesus more than this section we're about to get into. It's a powerful, some, you know, it's, I think it was Quartz and said we're we're getting treading holy ground now when we get into into this section of the Bible here. This is a powerful section. It's going to take us uh, two weeks to get through it, but we see the humility of Jesus. That same dictionary, 1828 dictionary, defined humility as freedom from pride and arrogance, humbleness of mind, and that in theology, humility consists of lowliness of mind, a deep sense of one's own unworthiness in the sight of God, and submission to the divine will. Well, that doesn't sound like Jesus. That sounds like something we should strive for, but, but how does that apply to Jesus? He's God. He's God. Submission. What do you... A deep sense of one's own unworthiness in the sight of God, submission to the divine will. Well, obviously that isn't talking about Jesus. That's talking about us. And it is. You and I can't be humble. We're just not made that way. We're naturally prideful. We're born that way. We don't like when people think less of us. We don't like when we don't get our way or our say in something. We are prideful people. We don't like to be humbled, meaning we don't like to be made to feel less or less important or less smart or less anything. We are naturally prideful. None of us want to feel less than, than, than the way we feel right now. We like to feel good about ourselves. We like to feel important. We like to feel smart. God gave me a word the other day for a funeral I had to perform. All I had to do was deliver it. I had to do a funeral Friday and it was an awkward funeral for me. I didn't know the person, and, and I'm, Lord, I need a word. I don't know what to say in this situation, in the situation of that funeral. It was somebody I didn't know, and, and, um, and he gave me a word. It was a good word. All I had to do was deliver it. So it, it, part of it was a scripture. So halfway through, I had wrote, I written down the scripture, and I said, and I said, you know, I want to share, you know, share the scripture with you, Ecclesiastes 7, 1 through 4. And, and this is Solomon speaking, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I go to read the scripture, and it's not there. <laughs> I forgot to write the scripture down. I'm like, oh my goodness, where'd it go? <laughs> so, you know, I had, fortunately, I remembered enough of it. I was able to get myself through it. But that was humbling, because <laughs> they're waiting for the scripture, and I didn't have it. That was humbling. And, you know, like you were talking about, Dave, you know, don't be so serious. And, and I just pictured, and I did, I, I did not picture Jesus like, I told you, I gave you the word. I gave you the scripture. I just pictured him laughing. I, I pictured Jesus hanging out with the angels, putting together my blooper reel for when I get to heaven. And, and we're just going to have a good time watching all my mistakes. <laughs> I think he's just laughing. But I was nervous to speak in front of that group. 
you know, I, the, the word that he gave me could have been delivered so much better. But why, I was nervous to speak in front of this group because I didn't know them. They, they were, you know, they weren't you guys. They weren't, it was, it, I'm, I'm not a natural speaker. And, and, and it was the nerves that got to me that, that affected the delivery of the word God gave me. Why was I nervous? Because I cared what they thought about me. Because I cared that what are they going to think of me, and, and that made me nervous. And and that's it's not about me, is it? You know, we have to learn. It's not about you. I gave you the word. You just give them the word, and let. Don't be worried about how th- that's pride. You know, we we battle pride. I battle pride. So if I battle pride, I know I know it's an issue for all of us. We care about what people think about us. You know, Jesus didn't care what people thought about him. And he proves it here in these, in, in these scriptures. You know, he said, let this mind be in me that was also in, in Christ Jesus. Verse 6 says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So he was God and he knew it. He knew he was God. It wasn't like he had to find out. He, he knew he was God. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one, Jesus says. In John 14.9, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He wasn't claiming something he had no right to claim. It wasn't robbery for Jesus to claim he was God. So he knew he was God in the flesh, on the earth. He, he absolutely knew this. So, And what does he say? He says in verse 7, but made himself, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of, of men. <laughs> well, first, let me just say, he. What does that mean? He he. T- he humbled himself, made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. Is the, we is where we get the word kinos, the the theology of uh, kenosis. He he emptied himself. He emptied himself of what? Not his divinity, because we just he just said he. He, had, he didn't consider robbery to, to be God. He was God. He was 100% God here on earth, and he knew that. He didn't empty himself of being God. He emptied himself of his divine powers, though, didn't he? You know, he emptied himself of the, of the powers that, uh, of being God here on earth. And this is important. Listen, he was still God. He was still divine. He never stopped being God. He just emptied himself of his divine power. He became dependent on the Father. Everything Jesus did, the miracles, the prayers he prayed, the teachings he gave, weren't done in his own power. He became dependent on the Father. He had to hear from the Father. He got received his powers from the Father. Everything he did, he did not on his own because he was a man. He did on the Father's authority, with the Father's power, with the power of the Holy Spirit. He needed the Holy Spirit. You know, he, everything he did was through the power of the Holy Spirit as he followed the Father's directive. So what does that mean to you and me? Why is it important to know that when Jesus became a man, he was 100% man and 100% God? Because we look at Jesus, well, that, that's easy for Jesus. He's God. You know, but when Jesus faced temptation, he faced temptation as a man. Just, just like you and I face temptation, Jesus faced temptation the same way. Well, well, Jesus, that was easy for him to overcome it because he was a, a man, because he was God. No, but he, was, he faced it as a man. He depended on, on submission to the Father to overcome the temptation. You know, Jesus, you know, Jesus prayed all night. Well, that's easy for Jesus. He's God. It's easy for him to pray all night. How easy is it for you to pray all night? Well, guess what? It was just as hard for Jesus to pray all night as it is for you to pray all night because he prayed as a man. He was dependent on the Father, on the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to pray through the night. So can you pray through the night? Yes, you can if you depend and rely and submit to the Father. Jesus, his life truly model is truly a model for anyone willing to be directed by the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, he never set an example that we can't follow. So you say, well, you can't, we can't say, well, he was God. He could do that. 
No, he did it as a man dependent on the Father. He emptied himself of his divine attributes and became a man. And, and so he was dependent on the whole Father's directive and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we must, you know, have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, a humble and submissive mind. You know, there's really two types of people <laughs> when you think of, you know, there's that person who comes into, who walks, you know, who might walk into a room and say, here I am, here I am, let's get this party started, I'm here now, look at me, isn't there? We know that people like, and there's the people who walk into a room and say, there you are, there you are, how are you? What's, how is your life? What's going on? You're here now. I'm so glad you're here. Now we can get this party started because you're here. There's the person who thinks they're the center of attention. The world revolves around them. And then there's the person who thinks that the world revolves around everybody else and, and is focused on the cares and the needs and the concerns of others. I mean, we really, there, there really are, you know, we know who we are. Think about how Jesus entered the world. This, the world he created. How did Jesus enter the world? Here I am. Here I am. Now we can get some things done. Look at me. Is that how he entered the world? No. Is there, is there a humbler way that Jesus could have entered the world than the way he did? Born in a lowly stable, a manger. Who, who, was that? who showed up for, for Jesus' birth, for the, the God of the universe when, when he was born into this world? Who showed up? A couple of shepherds? Who should have been there? How about every angel in heaven and every created being on earth should have been there to welcome God into the world, but God chose not to have, chose not to force, he could have forced people to be there, but he chose the, the shepherds to be there, the lowest of the low at that time, to, to, to welcome him, to be there, to welcome him. Because he's not saying, look, uh, here I am, look at me. He's saying, I'm here for you. He, he came for us. He came humbly. And that's important. He didn't force anyone to be there. He was willing to be born in a dirty, filthy place. He was willing to grow up in a miserable town named Nazareth. He was willing to be an unknown carpenter. <laughs> he could have showed up in all of his glory and splendor. He could have shown up. We, you remember the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transformed? Well, that's who he was. You know, he was in, his, in, in all of his Shekinah glory. He could have shown up like that. We couldn't miss him then. Well, there he is, and we would bow at his feet. He could have shown up in all of his glory and drawn attention, and we would, wow, look how amazing he is. We've never seen anybody like that in all of his brilliance and splendor and glory. He could have shown up like that, couldn't he? Boy, that would have caught our attention. But he chose not to. He chose to be to grow up in 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 poverty and or in a poverty condition. I mean, I don't think he was poor. He, we know that he got a lot of money from the the wise men. But he grew up unannounced in where he was. Even his own the people in his own town didn't recognize him when he came and said, "I'm you know he was the Messiah." He didn't. Instead, Isaiah 53, 2 for 3, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There's nothing, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He could have shown up in all of his glory and that he decide, chose, he could have been born the most handsome man on earth, and, and, and people couldn't help but notice him. Man, that's a good looking dude. You know, be, he decide, but there was nothing about his appearance that would draw us to him. He was God. He could have come in any appearance, yet he chose to be born an ordinary person that nobody would notice. Nobody would, he would just go completely unnoticed. How many times do you check the mirror before you leave the house? <laughs> Well, I got, I'm, we got to make sure we look good, make sure our appearance is good. But I do. We all do. Before Most of us do. Some of you don't care. But no, you know who you are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we care. We care about our appearance. It's probably embarrassing how much we look in the mirror before we go out to make sure we're proper and, and everything, you know. 
<laughs> Jesus could have been the most handsome man who ever lived if he cared about that. We care about what people think about us. You know, we care about what people think. You know, we care about when people ask, what do you do for a living? I mean, I dealt with that for years because I was a carpet installer and I didn't like being a carpet installer. I didn't think it was a proud, you know, something to be proud of, you know. And it, for me, it, it wasn't. I, I, I settled into it, but it was a dirty job. It was a hard job. It was, you know, to me, it didn't carry a, a, any esteem with it. You know, so when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I would always tell them, well, I'm self-employed. <laughs> Because that sounds much better, you know, that's, you know, because, you know, because we care. We care what people, I, I cared what people thought. Jesus came and he took on the nature of a servant. He could have taken on the form of a king. He could have been a king. He could have been anything. He came and took on the form of a, of a servant. You know, he, he worked as a carpenter. I had a carpenter come to my house a couple months ago to hang a, a door out on my garage, and 2,000 years ago, that could have been Jesus. Think about that. He came as a carpenter. He went to people's houses, or probably he, he built things for people, and I was wondering, you know, I mean, I was a carpenter, so I was a good carpenter, star, but people would complain all the, every now and then. I doubt that Jesus ever made anything wrong. Like, I doubt he ever cut a piece, you know, made something off level or anything. I bet people still complain. Could you imagine being that person, that customer that complains about something Jesus built? <laughs> you know, when you get to heaven, I just think Jesus is going to have a laugh at that. I, you know, but we'll finish this um, next week, but unity and humility go together. We're united as a group when we're humble as individuals when we esteem each other as higher than ourselves, as more important than ourselves. And you know, I was thinking about it this way. If we only cared about ourselves, if everybody only cared about themselves, how many people actually would care about you? Well, just one, you, right? <laughs> when we all, if we all esteem each other more than we esteem ourselves, well, how, or care about others more than we care about ourselves, how many people care about you then? Well, everybody, everybody, everybody cares more. That seems, like a, that seems like a much better place to live, doesn't it? We live in a world today where we, we esteem ourselves, you know, and, and that's why our world is such an ugly place. Heaven is a place where we esteem others. We care about others. We love others. You know, heaven on earth is when we humble ourselves and we put others before ourselves, you know, and, and that takes work. That takes effort. That takes God. That's not something we can do. We cannot be humble. We need to have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? But by the Spirit of Christ, by the Word of Christ, implanted in our hearts. We can become like Christ and put others ahead of ourselves. And there's something very attractive about that. I remember a few years ago, you know, Joyce and I were walking on a beach in Mexico. We were on vacation, and, and, and there happened to be another beautiful woman on the beach other than my wife. We both noticed her. As we're walking, we, we see her. She's like half in the water, half out of the water. And, and, and as we get closer, we see that she's just taking pictures of herself, like make poses. And, and we walk by her and turn for ways, turn around, come back, and she's still taking pictures of herself. And, and I don't remember her because she was beautiful. I have no idea. I don't remember what she looked like. I remember her because it was so unattractive. It was so unattractive. It was like the, the, the love she had for herself, all the beauty, the, the physical beauty she had, whatever, you know, she was so proud of herself that, that, that it was just to me, it just to both of us, it came up across as unattractive. That, and that's what I remember, you know, the, 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 the love for self is unattractive, whereas unity and selflessness and, are, and hum humility are, are so attractive. You know, that's what we're drawn to when, when, you know, humility. There was nothing physically attractive about Jesus, yet multitudes of people were attracted to him. 
multitude, 2,000 years later, 2,000 people are still attracted to Jesus because of, of his humility, because of the life he represented here on earth. You know, there's nothing more attractive than loving and caring about others more than yourself. There's nothing more attractive than that. People remember that. You know, I always say, to know him is to love him. You know, this is one of those know him scriptures, to get to know him in his humility, you know, in, in what he did. When we grasp what he did by leaving heaven and becoming like us, we'll love him more. We will love him more. And we'll look at more of this next time. But I want to tell you what, what God did share with me to share at that funeral. Because it, it was good. At least I thought it was good. Because it just it came to me. You know, because I didn't know this man, and, and, based, and, I'm, I, and I'm not, I can't judge him. I don't know whether he's in heaven or not. I really don't. His, his wife believes he's in heaven, and, 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 I'm, and we're good. But, so my job wasn't to place him in heaven or hell. So what do I tell these people? And, and he said, you know, the same thing. He told the same thing that I'm going to realize. Because I said, listen, when he is standing before Jesus, because, listen, whether we're going to heaven or hell, we're going to stand before Jesus, aren't we? And we're going to look him in the eyes. I said, I know one thing. He's realizing something right now that he didn't realize while he was here on earth. He's, he didn't live a life for God on earth. But I said, but I'm going to realize the same thing. And, and you're going to realize the same thing when you look into the eyes of Jesus. Something you didn't fully comprehend while here on earth. He's going to realize just the intensity and the depth of love that Jesus had for him and for me and for you while on this earth. And what is he going to think? What am I going to think? What are you going to think when we stand before Jesus and look into his eyes and realize the, the, the love that he had for us? We're going to, our first thought is going to be, I wish if I had only known, if I really knew the love that Jesus had for me, I would have lived my life more for him. I would have lived an obedient life for him. I would have surrendered more for him. I would have tried to get to know him better here on earth. All of us are going to experience, we can only know him in part. Now, when we see him face to face, we will know him as he is, and we will ex realize just how much he loved us. And we're going to regret any moment in this life that was not connected with him. And it's, you know where it starts? It starts with knowing that he loved us enough to die for us. Listen, that's just the beginning, folks. That's just the beginning, understanding that he is who, he's, that he, is who he says he is, that he came to this earth humbly, submitted to the Father, sur surrendered his life to the Father, willingly, willingly died on the cross so that we can live and be with him in glory. That's where it starts. That's just the starting point. I, that's where it begins. That's where the relationship begins. That's where we be begin to learn about the love of God. But as we get to know him more and more, we're just going to want to surrender more and more. You know, it was sad. It was sad. Whether, whether this man is in heaven or not, I don't know. But it was sad to know that he lived a good life here according to the worldly sta world standards. But in my heart, knowing that it could have been so much better, take away all the worldly blessings, but just give me Jesus. And his life would have been so much more fulfilling. His eternity would be so much more fulfilling. You know, and that's what the Lord's speaking to me today. Man, get to know him. Get to know him because he really, he really loves us. Amen. That's where it begins. Do you know this morning that he loved you enough to die for your sins? And all we have to do is, is you know, James or Paul says in Acts, if we would just reach out to him, he's not far from any one of us. He's not far. We reach out to him and his hand is right there to, to meet ours. If you've never done that, we want to give you an opportunity this morning to do that, to reach out to him and say, I don't know this love like you're talking about. I don't want to waste this life on myself anymore. I want to begin this relationship with Jesus that you're talking about. I, when I stand before him in glory, because we will all stand before him, he's either going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, or he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. We need to get to know him, church. If you don't know him today, I want to give you an opportunity. Say, yes, Pastor Jim, I want to get to know Jesus. I want to receive him as my Lord, as my Savior. And, and we just ask that you say a simple prayer with us, confessing 
that, yes, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Compared to His holiness, we are but sinners. But we can be made righteous in His sight just by receiving the sacrifice that He made, believing in it. Anyone this morning want to say a prayer saying, yes, I, I want to meet Jesus this, today? Just raise your hand. We'll say a prayer with you. We'll be happy that you've done it. Uh, he said, be bold. Be bold in front of witnesses, right? Well, okay, well, I don't see any hands, so I'm going to believe we've all done that. And, you know, the message was for us, church. <laughs> it was for us, you know. There's nothing that you can do on this earth besides humbling ourselves, surrendering. Nothing that this world offers that you're going to be so, oh, Jesus, I'm so glad I spent that time doing this or that. We're all, the only things that have any value in heaven are those things that we do with Jesus. Amen. It's, it's hard for us because we're so selfish. We're born with the selfish nature. You know, I was selfish Friday thinking, what are they going to think about me? <laughs> so, you know, we, we all share in this. So let's pray for us. Lord, I do help, help ask that you would help us. Help me, help us all to see that this life is not our own, that it's been bought with a price, that it belongs to you and only you. Lord, that you, could, you would have your way with us, that our selfish desires, our selfish nature would disappear little by little, Lord, that it would disappear, that we would really live this life get pursuing you, pursuing Jesus, getting to know you, learning to love you, falling in love with you day by day, Lord, that our life would truly be full, Lord, not of the things of the world, but of the things that you would have for us. Jesus lived the greatest example ever. His life was full, Lord, and as we'll see next week, because of that, you highly exalted him, highly exalted him. Lord, may we be humble before you. May we humble ourselves, and as we humble ourselves, Lord, you will lift us up. You will give us more than we could have ever imagined in this life more than we could have ever imagined. Lord, I look forward to your word, Lord, the next time we discuss this, Lord. But begin to prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts to receive and to surrender, Lord, to, to, to your word, to your will, to your ways, Lord. So just thank you. I do thank you for the unity of, of spirit, the oneness of mind that we have here, the desire for this fellowship to grow and to expand, and, and Lord, the, the, the welcome welcoming spirit we have here. Thank you for our guests. Bless them as they prepare to go back to their homes, Lord, their towns. Lord, it's been a pleasure to have all of them with us today, Lord. And so to thank you for bringing Calvin back to us safely from his trip. Trust that he, have, he was blessed on that, Lord. So just be with us all as we go. May we be, truly be a blessing to someone. May we put someone, you know, may we learn to put others in front of us by, by experience, by practice. Be, may we be intentional this week about putting others in front of ourselves and, and watch the blessing that, that you give, Lord, when we make sacrifices for, for the well-being, the benefit of others. So, Lord, we just ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord.